Buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò uh, for the presentation and the screening of L'albero degli zoccoli by Ermanno Olmi. Um, I'm delighted to be able to present this new digitally remastered version of Albero degli zoccoli, Trier the Wooden Clogs, uh, that has been just produced by the Criterion Collection. At the end of the screening, it's a club that produced this uh, restoration and this new uh, DVD um, that came out uh, just a few months ago will be with us and we will discuss with him uh, the film. I promise we will not be too long since the film already lasts three hours and ten minutes. <laughs> oh, you didn't know? <laughs> um, it's, also, it's also a great pleasure to welcome my students uh, from the class Italian Films, Italian History to the screening and of course I expect them to be very active uh, during the discussion because I'm about to give them a final grade <laughs> so you can bet they will. Um, and just a few things about the movie. Normally we don't talk much about the film before the screening but this film really deserves uh, just a few um, suggestions while you watch it. Um, first of all, the, the rhythm of this film. It's a film that seems very slow, and it's even slower. Uh, it's not events-driven. The, the time is paced only by the seasons. When you live in the middle of the countryside, in a farm in the middle of nowhere, the only sign of the time that goes by are the seasons. And that's what really gives the rhythm to your time. And the bells of the bell tower. Um, and, and Olmi says that that was his um, most important um, achievement in the film, and he says, it is the rhythm of life as it is, not as we transformed it into. It is structured on a time different from ours, faithful to the seasons and silence that the very rural nature highlights and expresses. A time that is more interior than exterior, rural, biblical. So just to give you a sense of do not expect major things to happen that change uh, the perspective of facts and events. Um, do we know the year uh, in which the film is supposed to take place? It's 1898. We, the only reason why we know it is that towards the end of the film, uh, the young couple that gets married goes uh, on a, a honeymoon, and you will see what kind of honeymoon it is, um, in Milan, when uh, specific events take place that are, can be dated to that year. You will also see that politics and political movements appear sort of in the background, but they're definitely not the major focus of the film. Um, and we can talk about that also at the end. We are at the, in the middle of the, at the end of the 70s, there are years of very, very uh, violent uh, political debate in Italy, if you want to call it like that. It's the time of the year of the gun, uh, the Red Brigades. It's the exact year in which Aldo Moro was kidnapped and killed. Uh, were, these were years in which basically uh, every day on television there were news of acts of political violence committed against uh, judges, politicians, trade union leaders, journalists, and so on and so forth. So you'll see how, how the perspective of Olmi on politics in this film is very different. And one more thing I would like you to um, concentrate on while you see the film is uh, the music. It's a beautiful, beautiful soundtrack. It's basically music by Bach and Mozart played on the organ only. And the music, though, is not only an accompaniment of things that happen, it has its own role. I'm convinced that music in this film is one of the protagonists, and, and also we can talk about that. And then now a trigger warning, they actually kill a pig during the making of the film. So they could not write, no animals was hurt during the, they, animals were hurt during the making of this film. Specifically, a pig and I think a couple of, uh, of geese, if I remember correctly. But yes, they were hurt. So if you have problems with that, when you see it coming, close your eyes. Um, it was part of the daily life in a, for a family living uh, in a farm. And it's absolutely one of my favorite films. It won the Cannes Film Festival uh, when it came out. Um, and it's really the film that gave uh, Tormano Olmi, that is one of the greatest Italian directors. And if you ask me a great man, the 
uh, fame that he still enjoys today. And enjoy the film. Thank you for staying with us and for enjoying together these three hours and 10 minutes uh, of uh, Hermano Olmi masterpiece, The Tree of the Wooden Clogs. Uh, our guest to talk about this film tonight is Issa Club. Who Hello, everyone. Who works for the Criterion Collection that, as you know, um, is responsible for bringing to light or bringing back to light many um, art films, author films, foreign films, and we are particularly grateful for what they do for Italian cinema. Um, also because anything they, they touch is brought back to the original splendor. I was telling Issa that I, I've used this film in my classes for more than 20 years, and there are things that I saw tonight that I've never seen before in terms of the clarity and the um, brightness of the image. So for that, I think we all should be very grateful for, for, for what they do at the Criterion Collection. And Issa, you worked also at the restoration, basically, and the uh, digital reproduction of this film. And uh, Hermano Olmi, who is still very active, he is still making films, and he's 87, I believe, and not, and not, yes. in, per and not in perfect health of course was involved also in the process, in this process. And what did you have to discuss or decide with him or, and what was his input and his take on this film? Sure, I, I should say first of all that uh, we, we have an office over uh, just on the other side of Union Square and uh, we do lots of film restoration there. We uh, restore, uh, I'm currently working on the Joseph von Sternberg uh, Marlena Dietrich films from the 30s, and uh, we're restoring all of them th uh, there. And uh, I should say that we do a lot of work with the Cineteca di Bologna, and they, of course, are world-renowned restorers. And in this case, they did the actual technical work. I mean, of course, in close mm -hmm. contact with us, but uh, Olmi visited them in Bologna looking at the uh, the versions of the film as it went through the restoration process, and you know he's uh, like you say he's 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 has a a very um, strong opinion about this film, and I think it's you know it's widely considered his his masterpiece. I think, and um, uh, not that he doesn't have three or four other masterpieces, but uh, but the he has a uh, he had a strong take about this film, and I think. Um, the 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 way it looks now is um, I think how to put it he I think he doesn't want you to think of it as a film about nostalgia for a lost past it's it's more a it's a it's a way for cinema to capture for a fleeting moment a culture that is gone you know what I mean and for him he is, he said in an interview I think. Uh, La cultura contadina, right? Like the yeah. peasant culture is really the only culture worthy of the name, right? And for him, this was a chance to capture once and for all. And this was his longest project. He had he worked on this film for twenty years, from script through completion. And he did everything. He did everything. Subject, he shot script, it, uh, edited, everything. director of photography, barely, editing. Barely any crew. These are all amateur actors. They are all. De they are depicting their grandparents, basically. I yeah. Mean, that's what it is. And, and it seems that he captured them, the last generation, who had a memory of how things were done. So Absolutely. there is also a documentary aspect to these films Absolutely. in the sense that when these... And when he the himself was one of those people too. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, he, this, is his, this is where he grew up, and Bergamo, you know. And so he, his grandparents were also... Uh, you know, farmers, and uh, so anyway, I, th I think it, it's a chance for cinema. It's an amazing thing that cinema can capture a a, a gone, a, a, a lost culture. I guess is, is how to put it. Yeah, absolutely. And I've always seen it as a sort of a of a monument to that culture, to that the peasant absolutely. culture. Um, so it's not nostalgia, but it's a sort of um, monumental homage to 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 that civilization, to values of these people, and it's not. Um, Mythicizing them is not sanctifying them. They, you know, they have shortcomings. They have, uh, uh, they're not perfect. Not Far from it. Right. But all in all, it's it's a it's a system of values that work for them, and that produce uh, good things uh, on on many levels. I, I also think it's interesting. Uh, you know, uh, the the depiction of faith in the film yeah. is, is so important. And um, uh, one, I was. Uh, 
looking back at one of the interviews uh, that we have on the disc, um, and uh, one of the interviewers says, "Well, you know, there's there's miracles in there. There's a miracle in the film when the when the cow is revived." And he said, "No, no, no, no. It would be, it would have been a miracle if a dead cow got up, <laughs> <laughs> but a cow that was just sick is you know." It, but then he says. But it happened through fa her faith. It happened yeah. through her prayer. So it's just a, he understands as a, as a way of looking at the world and a way of a being in the world, right? Um, and and he depicts that so strongly, I think. Yeah, that that's a, that's a beautiful depiction, and it goes with the uh, homily of the priest and the sword of the French general, yes. and talking about another miracle that to the people of the time has very little importance, whereas. For that woman, that cow was the only source of right. of uh, welfare for her her, her children. Yeah. yeah, so the fact that he she implores all the saints in heaven and and it works. Right, <laughs> and you can't say it doesn't work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, we are open for questions and uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, Emmett. Um, I think it was very scripted. Yeah. And in fact, he, um, I don't think he coached the, act. like I said before, they, these are all totally amateur actors. Um, but I don't think he coached them too yeah. strongly, but he had the camera, he was the camera operator. And I think pretty much there was not much else, not m much other crew there. So he had all the time he wanted. They had that location, that farmhouse. And one of the great, um, uh, supplements on the edition if you ever have a chance to look at it or if you are, are a Filmstruck subscriber uh, all the uh, supplements are also on Filmstruck and you can look at it there. There's are you familiar with Filmstruck? It's like the Netflix for film people and the Criterion Collection and the TCM? Turner, yeah. Uh, Turner, yeah. they're combined so you have access to hundreds of, uh, of good films. I mean Ex exceptional films, right. and also to the extra uh, content. When we can, and when we have the, when you know, it's not every film, and not every, it's it's uh, it's a little complicated, but but for the most part, yes. And so, and for the Tree of Wooden Clogs, it's certainly true. You, uh, all of the supplements that that I licensed and put mm -hmm. on the the disc, the DVD and Blu-ray, are also on on Filmstruck. And um, there's a British uh, omnibus program from the uh, basically three or four years, I think, maybe five years after the film was made, and they, they go back, they interview Olmi, of course, but they also go back to the location, and it's really just kind of a decrepit, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it's about to be torn down, I think, and on the outskirts of Milan, and there are children playing in the grass and stuff like that. So, you know, he, but he had this location um, that he had free run of, and he, I think he had all the time in the world to basically create a kind of, you know, his vision of what the, that past was like. And then one thing that I didn't mention in the beginning is that even if you're fluent in Italian and oh. speaking also to my students, that doesn't I, help. I hope, I hope nobody came here uh, to practice their Italian. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. they, they speak a very strict dialect from the, from the, um, uh, flatlands near Bergamo, then if you go to the mountains near Bergamo, <laughs> it's a completely different dialect again, with guttural sounds and aspirations and so on and so forth. So much so that both Dante in the, uh, the Vulgari Eloquentia, the treatise that he writes in order to discover the perfect languages, as, and the farthest possible you can go from the perfect language is the Bergamasco. <laughs> and then in, again, Calvino in um, the, um, the Baron in the Trees that we presented here uh, a few months ago, Again, when the Baron jumps from one tree to the other, and he goes to different uh, parts of, 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 of Italy, and when he arrives in Bergamo, he says, and I couldn't understand anything of what they were saying. There were all these H and H <laughs> sounds, and U and U, and, and it, it's impossible to understand. So it's all in dialect, and uh, there were problems also in Italy when it came out, because yeah, at yeah. first they thought people would understand, and they had to put subtitles also in the Absolutely. Italian version. Well, uh, uh, I we used to work with a film scholar and critic who um, said when he first went to uh, Italy and to work on uh, the neorealists, he he, um, he saw La Terra Trema in in a, an archive with, and he was able to watch it with a subtitled print. And all the Italian scholars were like, "What did they, what did they say there?" <laughs> <laughs> because the Italian print wasn't subtitled, even no. though the dialect is completely incomprehensible. 
Um, one of the things that's notable about this audio track that you heard, the, the Bergamask audio track, is that it's production sound. It's, it's location sound. Very rare for Italian cinema the, in general. They also did a version in Italian, dubbed, they did, right? Which is, also on, uh, which is also available. Oh, you have also the We sound. do have that. It's, it's, you know, I mean, and I do believe it is actually the same actors yeah. doing, yeah. you know, dubbing in the Italian, but uh, yeah, it's totally worth listening to, but, um, you know, it's a different experience. The, 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 I think the, the confluence of language and image is important to the experience of the film. Absolutely. And also here, sometimes they speak Italian, very few things, mm -hmm. sometimes the priest or the ladies that are dressed more elegantly, the nun speaks Italian. But when they speak Italian, it sounds artificial. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they're making an effort. Like the people like of my grandparents' generation, when they spoke Italian, that they knew because they learned in the school. But I remember how, diff uh, how hard it was for them to articulate the full sentence in Italian. Right. And it sounded like somebody who knows the language but is speaking a foreign language. And I think that's the effect. So even for this, I think, it, once again, only captured the last generation who was more familiar with the dialect than with Italian. Because these people, these people speak dialect perfectly. I think even the kids, you realize the children speak dialect perfectly. Now if you go to the Valley of Bergamo, no, no children speak, Italian, speak dialect mm -hmm. in this way. They might say a few words, especially curses, uh, <laughs> but they, they're not fluent in, in dialect. So that too uh, is in a perspective a monument to a civilization that is disappearing. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Right. I think that's a really good point. And, and one of the things that I think is um, uh, that I kept thinking about when working on this film was uh, that the origins of the sort of slow food movement happened right about the same time. And I feel like this is like slow cinema. You know, it's uh, artisanal cinema in a way. And uh, I feel like the, you know, the scene that so many people, I think a lot of urban people perhaps, uh, I have so much trouble with in this film is the butchering of the hog, you know, and and uh, and and yet it's if you if you eat pork you should probably be comfortable with that, right? Or else, uh, you know. So I think it brings that that scene brings balance. It's the whole yeah. thing about you know these people loved animals. Yeah. It's not that they didn't love them. You know, they they live with them. They were their companions. You know, the woman. And, and the cow, it's like an example of this. Right. And then at a certain point, you kill the pig. Because with the pig, the whole it's family nice, yeah. eats for a whole year. Yeah. And, and so as, as terrible as the sound it makes right. and looking at it, yeah. but it, it's this life that, is, the life that is lived in a complete symbiosis with the animals. The animals are in the, in the house. That in the evening when they tell the stories, they're in the stable with the cows. Right. So it's like they smell like animals, they live with them. Right. And at the end, you know, in the dynamic of this life, there is also the part of butchering the pig. I, I also think, you know, in a way, I started by talking about how this is a, it captures a, a moment, a particular historical moment in a particular region, and certainly the, the the types of life of just that exact region, right? And and Olmi is showing, like I say, his grandparents, right? Yeah. And but in a way, for me, I grew up in West Texas, you know, and my my grandmother uh, was born in 1904 and moved across Texas in a covered wagon and lived on a farm, and and in a way, this film speaks very much to my own past in sort of a universalist sense. 
um, of a, a kind of um, absolutely. You know, and I think it's how the, uh, why this film also resonated in so many different parts of the world. To, to go back also to your comment, that is very appropriate, um, because going back, if you go back to rural civilization, it was the same wherever you were in the world. I mean, there were it might change their religion slightly, but you know they were religious people. They felt a, a connection with the um, ultra terrestrial, ultra terrenal, the, the, with the divine, with the uh, with the spiritual that could be manifested in a way or the other. You know, they gave a lot of uh, importance to family because that was their first um, zone of protection where they felt comfortable, where they felt yeah. united. And the world was an enemy, and the world here is an enemy. Everything that happens outside of the farm is dangerous. You know, when they, when they go to Milan, you saw what happens in Milan. That's the only reference to historical facts. Right. That's 1898, that's when, uh, as a reaction to the new taxation on um, il macinato, on everything that was processed through a mill, uh, that was a, a horrible tax, uh, the most heinous measure that you could take, because basically uh, flour or any kind of product that went through a mill, uh, had to pay a tax per pound. And of course, for rich people, that tax was irrelevant. But for poor people, it meant the difference between being able to put a piece of bread or polenta on the table and not being able to. So in Milan, there are protests against this measure. And the, and the army, and, and led by a general called Baba Beccari, so orders to open fire against the crowd. And dozens and dozens of people are killed during the manifestation that were peaceful manifestations. They, were not, they did not have weapons. They were not attacking anybody. So that's the moment in which Olmi tells you, this is the moment in which these things are going on. So it, when, when this um, civilization is about to die, it's also because of the historical events. Even if they seem so far and distant from the experiences and the daily life of, of these people. And as a counterpart to that, there is the political rally, where there is the socialist speaker. And first of all, he speaks. Italian is the only one who has a full speech in Italian because the priest, when he preaches the homily, he switches back and forth from dialect to Italian. I don't know whether you have noticed. Whereas the, the politician speaks only Italian. It seems that these words are distance. way yeah. above the head of, right. the, of these people. As a matter of fact, one of the protagonists, Finard, looks at the golden coin. And through the whole <laughs> process of this uh, political rally, the only thing he's interested in is that golden coin now to take it home. So yeah. that also. I, I would like to say one other thing about that, because I think that was such a great uh, point and question. But um, it's also true that, that it's certainly true that more films, current films, should be made about rural life. Absolutely. But it's also true that almost no, it's, um, it's no other aspect of life ha is, has been as touched by technology as farming. Or farming now is completely different from how yeah. Farming is depicted in this film, and I think one of the values of this film is to just sort of freeze for a moment in time a a way of 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 producing food. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, as a, one of the consequences that this film had in Italy, and you probably are very aware of it, is that a little bit everywhere in Italy, in the north, in the south, the center, um, you have a flourishing right around this time of Musei della Civiltà Contadina, like small museums in every town of um, peasant civilization. And you know, they have the tools and the instruments and other things. Problem is that very often, if you don't see a film like this, you go there and see these tools and these instruments, and you have no idea how and what they were used for, and you know what was their place in the life of people. So, but that also, this film really marked uh, in Italy a, a renewed attention towards that um, towards that civilization. Uh, one last thing before we take yeah. the question, I think it's also notable that um, Olmi's other, I think, major masterpiece is Il Posto, and it's 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 an urban story, but it's a story of work. You know, it's a story of of getting a job, a young man getting a job, and I think there's something uh, s sort of he he has a uh, a theme running through his career of the nobility of labor and the nobility of work. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. No, absolutely. And you know that Olmi came, as, as Issa mentioned, from a peasant family, but he never was in a farm. Uh, his, his father died during the war, 
uh, his mother was basically raised the family on her own, and she worked at Edison, that was the electrical company. And, and he started working there very young. And his first film is a documentary about... A beautiful, we showed it here at the Casa a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's a beautiful documentary about the making of electricity. Where does electricity come from? And he was explaining that to a country where electricity was not even uh, yet arrived in all the parts of the country. And so he documents the, the way in which you uh, create uh, electrical power. And so to the mountains and the um, waterfalls. It's almost and an industrial, but at the same time, it's a beautiful film. Yeah. Well, he, he was able to convince the people at Edison to open a communication department. So they would buy him a camera, and he could finally start making movies. So the first movies are basically movies that he makes for the company for which he works, Edison and to document uh, the, the, the ways in which the, the, the company works. And then with the same camera, he borrows it and he starts making his first films. So it's first like it's industrial documentary, if you want to put a label on them. And then he moves on from that and, and starts making other films. Um, yes, Ben. You were talking about the sort of uh, the communist speech earlier. Socialist. Socialist, There was no communist at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, at the same time as that exists, it's never really played for laughs. Like the, the speech in Saint Paul's Thousand is actually quite serious for, 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 for what it is. At no point are they, do, they, do they promise something ridiculous or people do something stupid. They just kind of listen. I mean, the, the gold coin thing, I guess, is kind of funny. But do, do you think it is trying to be like a comedic farce that time? Or is it, or is it, or is it trying to be something different? I, I a farce, I would. Say yeah, definitely, it's an exaltation of storytelling. This was a civilization for which storytelling was the way in which they passed on culture. The homily of the priest is storytelling. The story told about the, the woman with the cut hand is storytelling. It's a lot of storytelling. That that's the way in which, for centuries, for thousands of years, uh, that is exactly that was the way in which they would pass their time, in which they would uh, pass on traditions and, and and stories. So I think what you capture actually is the centrality of storytelling to the civilization. I don't see any farces. Uh, yeah, element. I agree with that. I, I would say one thing about um, this film in particular, and the speech of the socialist is that. Um, only at the time, you know, I, I would say Italian film critics of the of this era were, by and large, very left wing, and yeah. uh, you know, very very left wing, and this film was not all that popular with them, you know, the the slightly distant speaking in Italian, uh, the, the the socialist giving the political speeches, is not particularly uh, relevant to these people's lives. The gold coin is much more relevant to his yeah. life than this speech, you know? And so, and yet I think now we can look back on it and see the, you know, the, the, the politics of this film in a slightly more generous light, uh, you know. Um, but absolutely. I, my, my, that would be my no, point about but this. But you're story. absolutely right. It was a time in which basically um, film critics were almost all communists, and they didn't consider only one of them. They never did. Well, and and, and he, he was not, <laughs> and he is not. He's, he's Catholic, he's Christian, in a, in a very open-minded and, and far-sighted way, if you want, in a very liberal way, if you want. But definitely, faith occupies a central position in his life. He's not somebody who boasts about his faith. He's not somebody who, you know, a fundamentalist by any mean. Uh, but definitely, he, he has never had a sort of Marxist vision of, of history. And in, for decades in Italy, if you didn't share that, you were considered outside of the game. And that's the reason why uh, Olmi, even if to me he remains one of the greatest directors in Italy, didn't have in, in our own country the recognition that he deserves. Other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned unity earlier. Yes. Could you, could you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, I think that the music basically it's mostly Bach, and there is a little bit, a little bit of uh, Mozart, but it comes from the house of the master, of the landowner. Right. So Mozart is the landowner, and you have the Marcia La Turca that the little boy plays on the piano, and then uh, when they play, I think it's uh, Julian and the Opera, the the record when they bring the corn to be weighted. Other than that, there is the music that is produced from inside the film. So it's, it's, you see the, the source of the music. Uh, when the music is from somewhere else, it's, uh, it's, it's Bach played at the organ. And definitely, you know, that's the presence of the divine. It's almost always connected with some sort of divine presence that manifests itself in very humble and unpredictable ways. That's, that's my take on this music. It's very, very clear, you know, when the, uh, there's when the woman goes to the well and that the music there is very strong and very loud and accompanies every act that she, um, she makes in, in, in her ritual. She builds her own ritual, her own, her own sacrament in order to bring health to her cow. But in many other uh, parts, when you know the, the, one of the beginning scenes, when you see uh, the people working the land, that's also this, there is a divine element to that. And then again, it's Bach, very, very loud and very, very clear. Yeah, I mean, it's a very strong statement. Every no, every now and then, I watch the film and think, "Ooh, that's <laughs> that's it's very heavy how <laughs> he lays it on pretty thick." But I think that you know, it's uh, still it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. How he how he puts it together. It's yes. Adam and then back, yeah. Um, sorry. Emmett and then Michael. <laughs> Would have you gone to see a film called The Tomato, uh, The Chicken Droppings? I don't think so. You know, the life of the, these people was not very uplifting and happy. <laughs> it was very hard and very, very difficult. And they got, you know, the few consolations that we saw, you know, the day of the marriage, you know, the honeymoon, they go to a convent with foundling kids and they go back home with one. I mean, say, we have to... <laughs> yes. No. I, I mean, to a certain extent, yes, and to a certain extent, no, because it's, it, it, the, the plot point is actually introduced at the beginning of the film, because the whole point of the kid going to school is, the, is, this, is this moment where it's the introduction of a new possibility and a, and a chance for this younger son to leave the life and move on. And it's so in a way, this act of almost hubris that causes the down, right? So um, I think you have to look at it in a more holistic way over the entirety of the film. Um. Yes, and you know, it would have been very difficult to find a, a, a different title because basically you have four families in, that live in this farmhouse. And the reason was one story that prevails over the others. Uh, and as I said before, it's basically a film where nothing happens in terms of big events. Uh, you know, there are no coup de théâtre. It's life in its yeah. normal development, you know, with some, some facts like this. I believe that if, if I had to come up with an idea, it's the Tree of the Wooden Clocks is also uh, an act. It's, it's the only, if we have to find something political on the part of Olmi in this film, Absolutely. is basically putting under your eyes the injustice that these people are suffering for. You know, he's... Um, kicked out of the farm because he wants to send his kid to school. And I think in that, there is a, a, if, if there is a choice, you know, the, the grandfather with the chicken droppings is very ingenious, but there isn't like behind any um, moral consideration because, you know, he's cute and the girl that goes with him. But I'm sure that comes from, uh, Omi has a, learned that story from, from his grandparents or something. Yeah, like absolutely. That. That's 100%, you know, a story he heard and put into the film.
Ja, absoluut. Ja, yeah, that, that was, if they were lucky, they would be wearing clogs. But even clogs, they were not for everybody. They were a luxury for, for many. So, or you would have clogs on Sunday, and the rest of the time you would go barefoot. I mean, not in, in the Middle Ages, at this time. So they, he makes clogs for Menik because he has to go to school. If he hadn't gone to school. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Everybody would, yeah. Yes? Yeah, but they find out easily. I mean, it's. Uh, that's that's a good. That's a good point, Sarah. The tree of knowledge, because basically, it's thanks to that tree that many can acquire knowledge by going right. to school. Do you have any other question? Yes. Nineteen seventy-six. The organ, yeah. yeah that was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Possible, but I don't. I don't know whether old me would have seen that. I, 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 right. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it's a very. I think the interesting uh, thing would be to see this film vis-a-vis -vis another film that would come out uh, two years later uh, by Bernardo Bertolucci, nineteen hundred. That yeah, on much some more dramatic, much and more political, much more yeah. dramatic, much more you know he has like always uh, compared to each other. All stars, uh, he has uh, Burt Lancaster, yeah. uh, Donald Sutherland, uh, Dominic Sanda, all the, the the names of American, Italian, French uh, uh, cinematography. The whole star system, and it's mobilized to create a communist film. Bertolucci intended 1900 to be shown at Feste dell'Unità, that were the big summer festivals of the Italian Communist Party, sort of as, as a sort of a uh, statement of political propaganda to uh, invigorate the um, party members to be aware of where they came from. So it's a very, uh, the, the final scene is that it's uh, fascism is over, uh, they, the, the peasants get revenge against the uh, nasty fascists, and Piece by piece, all, all these uh, red rags that they preserved during the dictatorship come out, and the women sew them together, and it's a huge red flag on the courtyard of these of this farmer. So it's a very different perspective, both from a technical point of view, because you know that Bertolucci, I would say, he he shoots in a very Hollywood style. I mean, he's sure. definitely much more familiar in terms of cinematography to what we are used to in this country. But also from a, from an ideological point of view, it's uh, it's very very different. It, that one represents the sort of the struggles of the of the proletariat in their uh, process to finally achieve uh, complete uh, emancipation and so on and so forth. R right, but but uh, is it one of the films you produce or not? Uh, Nineteen hundred, no. 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 Well, um, what's interesting about that is that you know he was only was criticized for the fact that the. Uh, the farmers uh, basically take this abuse, and there's no moment of resistance, and you don't see them fighting back. And I think Olmi's point is, resistance wasn't even on the table. It no. wasn't an option. It was survival. There's a, you know, and I think, and that's why I think this film has aged so well in terms of, you, you don't. There's no moment of the director reaching in and tipping the scale and saying, OK, these people, let's let these people fight back in a way that they never would have. You know, and I, 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 that's why it feels so true now, I think. Absolutely, because it's less ideological. Mm. Whereas in Bertolucci, it's definitely very, very ideological. 
and it, that it was openly so. I mean, he, he was not trying to uh, hide it and present it as something else. It was very explicitly ideological from with, with that specific vision. Any more questions or comments? Well, I think we, we had a, a great evening and... Thank you.